public on the meeting here. Okay, uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item is just instructions to the public on how to make a comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature. Located within the Zoom application screen, if connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Okay, thank you. Um, the first item is the adoption of our agenda as presented. Uh, the commissioners have had a chance to review it. I will ask if there's any questions or comments. No, looks good. Then I would ask for a motion to approve. Motion to approve. And a second. And second. So uh, Commissioner Campo motion and Commissioner Jason second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Is Tiffany's not with us tonight? You're Tiffany is not with us, so I'm scrambling down some notes, and Luke won't be with us tonight either. They are uh, both starting their holiday weekend. So you're, you're juggling bit. all the balls here. Though. Yeah, and truth be told, I, I don't know that Tiffany will be joining us much in the future. I've let her know that uh, I'm more than happy to take on uh, recording the minutes for her. So I just don't see a lot of reason for her to. Uh, she already does all the board minutes. Uh, and board meetings, I you know she doesn't go to the fire commission meetings, so I don't see a reason to have her uh, taking another weeknight up to come help us with this. Okay, good evening, Bill. Better late than never. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, item number two would be any public comment on non-agenda items. Nope. Nope. No public comment. Then we'll. Move along to item number three. The uh, we're looking for approval of our draft minutes of our October twenty seventh meeting. Uh, any comments from the commission? No comments. I no. make a okay motion to approve then. Second. Okay. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Jason, second by Commissioner Campo. Uh, all in favor? Okay. You, need to ask for, uh, you need to ask for public comment, John, I'm sorry. Oh, well, thanks you, Eric. Any public comment on our uh, adoption of our draft minutes? No, sorry. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eric, that's fine. Um, then we have a motion that carried unanimously. Uh, moving on to item number four, the draft minutes of the November 10th uh, board meeting. This is just something we will review. The one item of note I wanted to point out on there is that the board, uh, we did get a applicant to join the commission uh, and the board did appoint them um, and the board also appointed uh, both uh, John Toon for reappointment and Ann Shawson for reappointment. Um, the new commissioner is a gentleman named Ian Fine. I do know him uh, through the community. I think he's going to be a really good addition. I don't know if anybody looked at his uh, letter of interest that he submitted that was in the board packet. He's got a lot of environmental law experience. He is an attorney, um, works on a lot of federal projects, familiar with CEQA. He also has a lot of background in uh, you know, kind of uh, small town boards and commissions and used to uh, be a uh, reporter in a small town. So he's attended public meetings and understands the protocol. I think he's going to be a really fine addition. He's got a young family. They're very engaged and involved in the community. Um, he, he did uh, listen in on the last meeting. I think he's, you know, it'd be nice just to have somebody, anybody else, but I think he's going to be a really good addition to the commission. That sounds great. Our Looking forward to meeting him next month, or I should yeah, say, he, beginning he of the year. Join, uh, he will join in January. Right. We won't yep. be. And then, just month. to be clear, he was appointed to one of the vacant one year terms. And then, John and Ann, you were both reappointed to two year terms. So you're stuck. 
<laughs> Understood. So you leave. <laughs> Any other questions of commissioners about the Eric, is there, is there a, a maximum of six? Six, yeah. So it's five active regular commissioners plus an alternate. So now we're up to four. So we still have a vacant alternate seat and a vacant regular seat. The alternate seat, both of the, well, hold on. The, oh, I guess I need to update this. Um, yeah, so the, both the alternate seat and the alternate seat is a two year term starting at the beginning of this coming year. So it would have an expiration date of 12 31 22 and the vacant regular seat is still just a one-year term um, that would expire at the end of this coming calendar year so december of 21. right so uh please by any means i mean just because we do it by bylaws this time of year um as long as there's openings on the commission we're happy to entertain people who have interest and i'm happy to put them in front of the board for a formal appointment so if you do know other people um, be by all means share my contact information i'm happy to meet with them talk to them uh, and encourage them to uh, to apply and then that was obviously the last meeting for uh Three of our directors. They, yes. They, they, they also don't meet in December? Um, no. So, um, directors Naylor, um, Perry, and Green. So, Jeff Naylor, Isabella Perry, and uh, Leah Green. Their terms technically will be ending on December 4th. And we will have three new board members coming on. Um, one is Chris Case, uh, the other, another is a woman named Kathleen Kilkenny, um, and the third person is a woman named Lisa Ruggieri. So they will be joining the board with the December meeting. I've met with two of the three so far, uh, just in an onboarding. I've, I've met with all of them several times. Um, I think they're going to be great additions to the board. Um, you know, they, they all have a lot of experience that they bring to the table that I think will be valuable assets. Um, so they are on for four year terms um, and they will officially be seated with the December meeting. Well, that's great news. Is it a maximum of four years? Um, well, each term is, yes, but they can be re, uh, you know, if they rerun for election, right. re refile, they can serve. There's no maximum number There's, on how many terms they can serve as long as the public keeps electing them. Right, okay. Um, I did notice on uh, the board members' items of interest, uh, there was a question about shoring up the creek bed. Is that for erosion or? Yeah, so. Um, there was an area out by the pool complex actually over uh, kind of north of where the top pool area is um, that we had a little bit of land sub subsidence uh, kind of slip through there um, and it wound up uh, pulling a little bit of the fence that goes along there with it they've made the proper repairs at this point in time and Luke may have included it in his report um, I guess he didn't. Um, I can give you a little bit of a heads up. I mean, this was just kind of an unstable area. It does reach bedrock shortly there, and it didn't do any damage. It wasn't near the pump house. It wasn't uh, near the main pool. It's just, it's an area that we've you know kind of had on our radar for a little while. Um, at this point in time, they've stabilized it, uh, but this is you know kind of uh, their future agenda is you know, kind of looking at some of these areas. We have relationships with, you know, people like uh, the Straw Program um, and uh, Blue Point, who oversees a lot of that. 
uh, as well as some hydrologists who are local uh, that like to uh, lend a hand on this. So we're looking at kind of some natural areas, more natural options, uh, you know, some native plant things that can help shore up and diffuse some of the water. The issue is the other side of the creek along this section is, you know, basically solid bedrock and granite. So there's a lot of hydraulic force that goes through there and it pushes off the other creek bank into this side, which doesn't have the same levels of just, you know, the big granite chunks that are kind of uh, slate that are sticking out there. So it's, um, you know, just looking at some, uh, you know, natural kind of barriers and diffusers, uh, you know, some plantings, uh, you know, shallow root bigger, uh, that can help diffuse the water as well as provide habitat and uh, things that we would be able to do without having to launch into a massive uh, construction project, so to speak. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments from the commission? Then uh, we will move on to item number five, which is the Oh, at the public. Thank you, Bill. I apologize. Uh, any comments from the public regarding the board minutes? No. Okay. Yay. Thank you. Again, my apologies. I will try to recall this in the future. <laughs> All right, then uh, item number five, the Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report. Yeah, I'm going to cover this this month for Luke um, on the front page under recreation. He's just, you know, giving you all um, some information on some of the things that they're working on and planning just in terms of recreation. Obviously not being able to do our annual winter fest, much like they weren't able to do their, you know, Halloween harvest uh, festival uh, is a bit of a bummer, but they've been getting very creative as well as, you know, sharing ideas with other providers. So they're trying to look at some ways. One of the most popular things that we do is letters to Santa, and we have a little bit of an in so that letters that do go to Santa actually get responded to uh, for the most part. So we will be setting that up. You'll see some of that. Um, you know, and then he puts some information there on uh, classes and programs that are happening as well as some of the planning. Um, rather than go into all of that, but before we get into the park aspect of things, I just will ask if there's any questions on any of this. Okay, then on the park side, I'll give you an update on where we're at with the maintenance facility. I don't know if you have been down in that area in the last week. Um, the old maintenance facility is no longer. It is gone, right? At this point in time, it is nothing but, yes, exactly. It Wide is, open. It is a slab of concrete uh, right now that will also be gone as of, they're coming out tomorrow to do that, and then early next week, they will be um, removing the uh, modular office building, and then that section will be done. We'll do a little work, you know, just kind of cleaning up that area and making sure that it's prepared for some of the winter rains because um, a lot of people still do like to use that path. It's been um, closed off during this work uh, just to keep the public out and to keep it safe while they're trying to do the work that they're doing. They have some equipment back there. Um, but that's the progress on the demo. Um, the electricity has been temporarily relocated. Um, we had to do a separate permit for that, but that's been uh, approved and final inspections have already happened and PG&E has already come out and re-energized. So the meter has been temporarily moved to a pre-existing location that already had um, breaker boxes and everything set up. Uh, it's on a, a utility pole that is out there. Um, and then they, our, our electrical vendor was able to run a ground level line in conduit over to the temporary area. And we were able, I know Luke's report says sometime in the next week, um, this work actually got done yesterday and they were able to run power to the temporary office modular that we are leasing for the park guys. So they are up and as functional as they're gonna be for, for the next several 
months until we're able to finish construction on the other building. We have heat, they'll have air, um, they have lights, they have electricity. Um, they put up some, uh, you know, makeshift carports to cover up some of the equipment that just wasn't practical to put in this in the cargo unit. Um, and I gotta, you know, again, hats off to our staff because they've been doing a lot of the work and preparing, and they've had a very good attitude about understanding that uh, we got to take a step backwards before we could take a step forwards in terms of their work environment. So they've been very good about it. We've done everything we can to make it as good as we can. Um, and otherwise, that work is done, um, and as mentioned, demo will completely finish up early next week. We are, um, I talked to the contractor today, they will clear out the concrete tomorrow and then uh, clean up the area and make sure that, you know, there's no uh, readily identifiable hazards. And then for the holiday weekend, we will actually remove the fencing because it's supposed to be nice this weekend and people I am sure will want to be walking through there. The, uh, the, uh, and we want them to be able to do that. And bottom line is they'll go around the fencing if we don't take it down anyway. So we're going to get it all cleaned up by end of day tomorrow and be able to allow people to go through there and then we'll close it back up as soon as he comes back out to finish the demo. Um, when they're on site and able to work, I mean, they're they're doing things really fast. That maintenance facility got taken down in a day uh, for the most part. And then um, the contractor that we're using, I mean, he's got a really good setup and he's bringing out his own debris boxes two at a time. They're filling one, then the truck hauls that one off to be disposed while they fill the other one. And by the time he comes back with the empty one, the other one's full. And, I mean, it's really just a nonstop action. So they're when they start they're going through and they're getting it done very quickly they've been very good um, he sat down with me and went over all the environmental concerns that were shared by the biologist um, and the copy of the uh, of the uh, of the stuff that was given to me um, you know and signed off on it so he is good there um, it's really been uh, he's been very communicative he's been doing really uh, just really solid work. So uh, I'm appreciative of that. And then um, we are looking at finishing up. We still have the same goals as the stock talked about last time. We're hoping to get the bid package out ideally by the end of this year. Um, and I, in an ideal world, uh, probably best case scenario, being able to present the uh, bids to the board for their consideration February uh, no later than March is the goals we've just been getting hang up after hang up uh, not necessarily for compliance reasons but just delays from the county planning and now the permitting and uh, the building department uh, they're just really backlogged and having kind of a hard time keeping up and keeping track uh, I mean, it took us months to get uh, even a response on plan checks, and we don't want to put out a bid set to then, after the fact, have the county come back and say, we have to make a lot of changes to the plans, <laughs> because then if we put something out there, you either have to make a, a amendment or an addendum to the plans, or if the bids have already come in, then you start looking at, you know, really costly change orders. So our goal is, you know, we want 98% completed plans at, at the minimum to go out in the bid packet. So that way uh, there's no surprises that come after the fact, no costly change orders, no addendums, no amendments. Um, and the, we can really have a, a, a clear understanding of what the bids are coming in at. I think I mentioned last time working with the architect, you know, we're looking at several, uh, formulating this bid set and the bid package, um, you know, with kind of the base construction and then, uh, incorporating additional alternatives, uh, more commonly referred to as adults. So that way we can really kind of uh, look at how this is all put together. And then on the adults, we can decide what to accept, maybe all of them, maybe some of them, um, and go from there. So we're just trying to finalize what makes sense as adding as additional alternatives uh, versus part of the base construction set. So, uh, Eric, a couple questions. So, so is there a, a delay on the bid packages? And if so, uh, how, how many months from the original projections? Just curious. I'm not terribly concerned. Well, we had, I'm just trying to keep it in my... Yeah, we, we had hoped to already have them out by now. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and honestly, when we were, you know, submitting an inquiry for a plan check, which is kind of the, you know, the preliminary before you start going in for permitting, it was, uh, that was, geez, you know, three months ago now. Um, and we still haven't gotten firm response from the county on it. So we're going to go through a third party plan check service that is uh, approved by it's when I say approved, the county has a list of pre-approved vendors. Um, so we took the, a plan, you know, we contacted a few of the third party plan check services that are on their pre-approved list. Um, and we were even just trying to get response from the county that we could use them and we still could never even get that response. And then we started getting bounce backs to emails stating, you know, we're, uh, we're, you know, we'll respond as soon as we can. And so I think we're at the point now where we're just going for, uh, we're just going to do it and submit it to the third party. Um, because at this point, it's just really holding our projects up. I mean, almost, you know, I get it to a degree and I don't want to be the one who, you know, starts trying to just keep climbing the ladder and climbing the ladder and saying, hey, we need some action here. Uh, we're not alone in this. I've spoken to other agencies as well as private projects that are just having a really hard time uh, pushing things ideally through these initial stages of the permitting process once we get past that on the flip side i've heard that you know once projects have been pre-approved at that level plan checks have been approved and uh, uh, you know you're really into the permitting stage that they've actually been much more responsive because they're assigned to specific individuals you're dealing directly with specific people um, as opposed to right now, everything's just kind of going through their administrative desk and then kind of being farmed out. So it's, it's been frustrating to say the least, um, and we're just trying to be patient. Um, but we still have a goal of, uh, and I do think it's realistic of, you know, ideally before the next rainy season, this project has been completed. So the third party vendor then sounds like you have to pay a fee to go through them, right? Yeah, and, and you then... have to pay a fee to the county as well. Mm -hmm. And then what's their, what are they suggesting their timeline is for getting you to the point where you, you know, would have two enough. weeks. Two, okay. Oh, that's yeah, great. Two, two to three weeks. So uh, well, this is probably putting you behind by two to three weeks then or a month at most. Um, well, <laughs> yes, but considering that we've been trying this process through the county for the last two to three months, mm -hmm. um, that's how far back we've been kind of pushed on this. It's not the end of the world, in all honesty, because the construction of this nature in the middle of winter is a little bit tricky anyway, and we anticipated some delays on that. So it doesn't push us back too much farther in terms of completion from what we had because uh, we had a lot of contingency built into there with weather delays and so forth we had just really hoped to be past the bidding process by this point so we could have a very clear idea on what the uh, bid prices were that were coming in by now so that's the frustrating part mm -hmm. the other question i i had for you um around this was the the trailer for our maintenance staff I know yeah. that all happened kind of quickly that we had to sort of snap up this, you know, uh, temporary trailer that they're in right now. Um, are there options to make that a bigger space for them? Just walking by it. It's a pretty small space to go through the winter months and thinking about them in a rainstorm and we're, you know, COVID and everything. It's a really small little box for them to be in. Yeah, and I'm um, uh, certainly happy to show it to you. You know, they don't, to be quite honest with you, um, you know, that really is just kind of serving as a, uh, you know, an office and, uh, you know, even more secured storage. So there's not a lot of time they're spending in that. It's kind of like if you look at the building plans where we have kind of a work area set up in the new facility, it's like that area. Uh, yeah, and so when we kind of looked at the sizings and you know looked took into account pricing and what we need, we felt that this was a good size, and they have been able to. And I'm happy to you know give you a peek on the inside of it too, and um, because you know we've been able, you know they've got a fridge in there, they've got a microwave in there, they've got a desk where they can spread out. Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, are all three guys going to be in there in a rainstorm? That's too small for three people. That's what I'm getting uh, you'd be at, surprised. especially with I mean, pandemic uh, safety. Yeah, it, it's it's 20 by 8 um, as it is right now. So it's about 100 and, you know, uh, actually, I'm sorry. It's 24 by 8. Um, 
so you look at you know just under 200 square feet um, and when you look at the area that they would inhabit in the bigger uh, facility it wasn't that much bigger it does have ventilation to it, it does, you know and these guys are good on their protocols i don't know at this point uh about bringing out anything larger but i guess the best thing that i could say is that uh, every you know especially now we've got electric hooked up and everything else is uh you know, we ran this through the staff and looked at what our various options were and everybody else felt that this was adequate for what we needed to do. Okay, another thought I had, I just, you know, uh, I've been just thinking about this for like the last month or so, was I wanted to put it out there. I don't know if there's a way to bring them, you know, do they, they need like lunch once a week or something like that while they're in these not great conditions. I've just been thinking about what great work that team has done and how important they are, right? We want to keep our, long-term employees who have a great vibe, who are around our community members. The kids are all, you know, back in that area. And these are just, you know, trusted, well-known, great people. And this is going to be a, you know, kind of a rough spell going through this winter. So just thinking, you know, kind of a creature comfort thing. Like, can we get them a hot lunch once in a while or hot coffee or something like that? Sure. Like, you know. Sure. Well, that is, well, first off, that's thoughtful of you, Anne, and thank you. Um, you know, and I will say, um, I, I doubt that they would ever uh, turn it away and would be very appreciative well, if you wanted to do something. No, 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 no. So what I was thinking was something like through the through your budget. And I, I'm, I'm happy to do something on my own too. But like, you know, kind of like in a corporate setting, sometimes you'll have a weekly lunch for employees. Is there budget or capability to do something like that for them to have the hot food for them as part of their is like a perk of their job for the next few months through the rainy season yeah we well i well i can tell you uh, you know we take pretty good care of them um and we certainly recognize those things and uh, try as we can uh, you know recognizing that we have you know we're using public funds um, right but, but we uh, um Yes, to answer your question. And that does happen, um, especially in various occasions where we know they're just getting out and doing some, uh, uh, you know, in the elements or that kind of work. We make sure that, uh, you know, they get a good break and we've got lunch ready for them. And we always have coffee and everything else here in the admin okay. office uh, that they uh, have access to. And they have coffee maker, I believe, out there, as well as, like I said, you know, just some of the basic microwave fridge. Mm -hmm things along those nature. So we certainly do uh, take care of them as, as best as we can. Um, and I think that they recognize and appreciate that. Okay, that's good to hear. That's great. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, any other questions on the maintenance facility? Okay. Then uh, otherwise, you know, Luke identified, it just seems like we're having a lot of issues um, lately with our irrigation systems. Uh, you know, is, it, is it off, Eric? What's that? Is it off? Uh, it is getting ready to be off now. Oh, yes. it's still they on? Did, yeah, they did some more turf repairs and these are all the recycled water uh, stuff. So as they do some of these repairs and do a little bit of extra reseeding, they keep some of it on. Um, and even if the, uh, the irrigation system is off, um, this is a matter of, you know, literally shutting it off from the primary feed coming just off the street, which they're just about at the point where they're ready to do now. Um, the problem when they do that is, you know, it's kind of like when you put new brakes on your car and going through and bleeding through the lines and making sure you get all the air out of the system. Um, in one way, it's actually good that it's happening now. Um, this is a good time for them to do the repairs. Otherwise, all of these things would start springing up in spring um, when they fire everything back up. Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of, all, for lack of a better term, and, you know, the warranty is kind of worn out on, you know, it's an aging irrigation system. And the nice thing is, is that when, you know, they're able to go through, identify, make repairs, getting new parts, putting on, you know, the proper settings and the proper fittings and making sure that everything is good and should be good for, you know, the next 20, 30 years uh, as they find these areas and make these repairs. So, uh, but it's just uh, with everything else that's going on, you know, like Luke mentioned in here, 
um, you know, beyond just some of the pipes wearing out at the joints and the couplings, you know, you're looking at tree roots, ground compaction, gopher activity. It's just a lot of uh, stuff. So, uh, but no, it's, they're, they're just about at a point where they will be shutting everything down. It's been a relatively dry season. So they're a little bit hesitant on doing it too early, but uh, especially while they're trying to do some more of the turf repairs. But uh, while some areas have been turned off, there's still water in the pipes and pushing from the main valve, even if it's not running the sprinklers timing systems. Um, so they are just trying to fix these last couple things and then they'll be turning it off from the main street. I would have thought the system would have been older than 20 years. Um, it very well could be. Because I, I, would, I would have guessed it's the original. Is it, is, has it been, has the whole thing been pulled out and reinstalled? Not since the original, I would doubt. Um, but uh, that's a really great question that we don't have a lot of great documented history. The other nice thing as we're going through this is Luke's keeping really good, very clear records and files of where things are happening, when they were repaired, how they repaired them, what they've used. So we're actually having some documented history in the making here. Uh, John, it's just uh, Gary, uh, you know, God bless him, who was our old uh, park director, uh, where that position was eliminated. Uh, you know, we just did a lot of things in-house and there's not a lot of clear documentations or diagrams of where everything is. So as they go through this, they're creating all of that for future, uh, uh, future use. And, you know, once we're all gone, the next round of people will have something that they can be like, okay, here's where this runs. Here's where that is. Here's where this is. But unfortunately, you know, between Marco and Estevan, you know, Estevan's been here 17, 18 years. Marco's been here, you know, well over 20 years. We have a lot of institutional knowledge with them, um, but not a lot of documented knowledge. So what we're doing while we're doing this is documenting everything and having it very clear and accessible. Yeah, I went through the same thing in San Francisco when I was working on the systems there. Some of those were 60 years old <laughs> and it, same thing. There was no, nothing was documented. So yeah, I'm happy to hear that Eric is creating, or um, Luke is creating a paper trail for that stuff because who knows, whenever he's gone, unless it's written down, nobody's gonna know. Well, and, you're exactly right, John. And it just saves a lot of time, which is money. Um, yeah. Fine as you're going through these things. The, the other thing I would inquire about, which I would expect Luke is doing is, a lot of times when there's um, upgrades or improvements or repairs made there, they can be done with um, better technology in regards to water savings. It, and he's got that in mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're definitely, you know, and some of these things, some of the trickier parts too is, uh, you know, these will be cracks at couplings. And so it's a matter of, you still got to get the pieces that fit through the right pipes and then still able to put enough pressure uh, because some of these lines run so long and they run so many different sprinkler heads along the line to, you know, making sure that we have enough pressure that goes through there too. Um, and again, this is but, but I, I think the, the efficiencies are more with the heads in the, Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. we've got all of that already. We're past right. that. Um, right. with, you know, the high efficiency waterheads. And I know uh, shortly before I got here, uh, Tom Horn, Marco was part of a couple park people that actually went through an entire course on irrigation design and maintenance and everything else. Uh, so he just brings a lot of knowledge to proper spacing, proper, uh, just all of it. So, uh, you know, it, he's, it's pretty amazing to sit and talk to him because he, he definitely is very well versed and all of that, and you know, Estevan as well, just through his years of working here. So all of the, the heads that they're using, you know, in different areas for, you know, different types of sprinkler heads in different areas, uh, and definitely looking at, you know, uh, minimal water use, maximum coverage, um, everything else. So they, they do a pretty good job there. Do we offer them the opportunity to attend um, different trainings or, you know, to keep current with the technology as it changes? Yeah, we definitely have training budgets on there um, for sure. And they try to stay abreast of things that might be coming up. So if you are aware of various uh, workshops or something that is, you know, feasible for them to be able to get to, 
Um, obviously, right now, everything's limited online, and they're kind of work. Online trainings are fine for certain things, but not really effective for other things when they're really kind of trying to get into that. Uh, you know, it becomes a lot of theory and not necessarily, uh, you know, it's like taking an auto shop class online. Well, you know, uh, we'll show you how to do it, but you got to figure it out on your own. Right, right. Yeah, but by all means, we definitely have training budgets for them too. So as you, uh, if you are aware of something or you see something that comes through there that you think might be applicable, I would greatly appreciate if you push that to our team. I, I will. I'm not so much dialed into that now, but again, when I was in the city, that was something that was uh, severely lacking with our staff was training on irrigation. And if they're not trained well, it just, it costs us all more money in wasted water and inefficiencies. So right. um, it's just something that, you know, with the right knowledge, you can make actually a, a pretty big difference in, in water savings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, any resources you might have, if you see, um, even if it's just uh, resources of organizations or agencies that, you know, put on these types of trainings. Um, right. So that way we can get on their mailing list and making sure that we're aware and we know what's going on. Um, well, speaking of what, there's one that was, you were just making me think of, was it called Bay Friendly um, Landscaping? Uh, does that sound familiar? Mm, well, yeah, I don't know. You're asking I, the wrong uh, guy. John Toon, does that sound familiar to you? No. no um, I have to, I've been retired a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Bay, Bay Friendly Landscaping Guidelines, uh, Sustainable Practices for the Landscape pro Professional. It, it's really good. It's it, it's kind of a holistic training that talks about, you know, comp values of composting, mulching, um, high efficiency irrigation, native plants, um, just best BMPs for horticulture. Great, I wrote it down. I'll make sure to pass it on to uh, yeah. Luke and the uh, Luke and the guys. They do lots of trainings and certification programs. Um, a lot of people on our staff at Marin County Parks have gone through their process, so it's it's good. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, just some of their other work beyond the winter prep and kind of some of the other stuff that they're doing. Uh, we've noticed, especially lately, and John, I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot more, uh, I don't want to call them encampments because these aren't like homeless areas, but a lot more people, uh, a lot more activity in the open space in terms of areas kind of off the beaten path where they are... Uh, we're noticing gathering places um you know just not too far off the trail behind idleberry uh, we were alerted to somebody who was out there and noticed you know six or seven different chairs that had been brought out there like old chairs um and you know kind of evidence that people are just going out there and gathering um you know not a lot of trash or anything uh so to speak uh but so, you know, they've gone out and had to clean up a lot of that kind of stuff too. A small sofa we found on top of Grasshopper Hill, uh, just all sorts of random things, uh, you know, and you know, some of these could be kids uh, for the most part, teenagers or something, just setting up a place out in the, uh, where nobody's gonna bother them, where they can get together. Like I said, we haven't discovered an overabundance of ash or beer bottles or anything like that with them. Um, but all the same, when we find them, we clean them up and get them out of there. Yeah, we've noticed that across the county. And so the visitation in our parks, we have these trail counters out. And um, pre-COVID and during the COVID era, we've seen about 120% increase on just like, you know, um, trail use. But right. then in addition to that, you know, we've had illegal trail building, party spots, more trash, there's been a lot of activity. Um, I mean, it's the, the nice thing is that I feel like a lot of people are rekindling their um, relationship with the outdoors during this time, which is great, but there's, there's certainly a share of bad behavior too. Right, right, right. Well, and I think again, for a lot of these kids who've lost so many, uh, you know, when I say kids, you know, looking at teenagers or even young adults who've lost so much of their social opportunities, uh, you know, and they find a place where they can go and be left alone and nobody bugs them. Uh, 
but you know the the flip side is with so many more people to your point kind of rediscovering outdoors and out there walking around it helps get more eyes on these things so we get notified of it uh, that much quicker as well i mean you know we're small and we can't be everywhere uh, and people have been pretty good about letting us know and we have a good relationship with the rangers who let us know uh, about a reported uh, homeless encampment that they'd found in one of our areas. Uh, and it, it, we did find it. It didn't look like it was very active. Um, and our kind of, uh, you know, and I think the sheriff went out and checked it out too and, you know, put a, a sign out there that said, hey, you got 48 hours to get your stuff out of here. And if it's not gone in 48 hours, we're going to get out of, get it out of there for you kind of a uh, setting. So we've gone and cleaned up some of those as well. Right, right. Uh, was that, you know, I'm hey, sorry, Ann? was that camp you were just talking about with the sheriff? Was that recent? Um, this was, a, yeah, a couple months ago. Um, and this one was also kind of off the beaten path. Uh, and it was questionable whether it was on our property. This was also kind of towards that grasshopper hill area where you start to also venture into uh, uh, over towards the IJ. So IJ, I don't even know where that is. Uh, do you know where Grasshopper Hill is? Oh, so I see. So you're talking about like across from Marinwood Market where that bike trail goes up? No, no, no. Grasshopper Hill is the area off of Heatherstone. Uh, oh, okay. And mm -hmm. there's a big open space swath over there that actually mm -hmm. then goes all the way down to the freeway and kind of uh, butts up against that Pacheco uh, by the yeah, Pacheco okay. bike path. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that area uh, we've noticed. And that was one area where, like I said, somebody you know and the how these people go about doing this but you know somebody had put a small couch at the top of the hill there um you know as an overlook spot so uh, we got a call yeah. about that and uh, we're able to get that down and then uh, you know a month or so later was when we were also then told about a potential uh, you know little homeless encampment um, well it's so great you're on top of all of this i mean you yeah. you know we've communicated by by email one on one even before I was commissioner about this particular issue, which is kind of near and dear to my heart, but um, just for the other commissioners, like I have some experience in dealing with uh, homeless encampments. And once something becomes established, it's really, really hard to remove it permanently. So given Marinwood is is kind of this protected area, it's really special. Novato and San Rafael don't don't have the kind of um, situation that we have so the more we if there's any evidence of things that look like that is the quicker we clear them out um, and the faster we react to it the, the more likely we are to be able to keep things as pristine as they are in the area so I'm so glad to hear you're on top of it that's great yeah and it's a, a nice partnership with the sheriff and their rangers as well who are always willing you know if we come up on something and it looks like uh, you know it where we would be much more comfortable having law enforcement join us to help mm -hmm. us uh, clear it out. They're always willing to help out on that end. That's great. Yeah, yeah, and we do have agreements with them that allow them to uh, enforce on our land. And everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's helpful, but we also, you know, if it's something small and it doesn't look active and we can clear it out, uh, we also don't want to, uh, you know, be too much of a burden on that. Sure. Uh, otherwise, any other thoughts or questions on anything Luke has in his report here or other things that you might have had a question for Luke that I might be able to field for you? Okay. Okay, then uh, maybe I'll ask for public comment on the activity report. Okay, then we'll move on to item number six. Any uh, items of interest from the commissioners for future agenda items? Um, well, I had one, and it's, it's a little late tonight, so maybe another time. I don't know if, if other people would be interested in talking about, you know, uh, adding an option to make a formal entrance to the the uh, the trail by the maintenance facility that connects to Quietwood to make that an actual uh, entrance. And I, I don't know that that's something that needs to happen right now. I don't think it's something it could be, you know, we could stand up, you know, necessarily quickly enough um, around the timing of the construction that's ongoing there. But, 
been looking at that space and uh, there's been some recent discussion about it. Um, it sure would be nice actually to have another pathway that's accessible, that's ADA accessible there on Quietwood to connect those two loops, right? So there's one path a little further down on Quietwood that's ADA accessible. Um, and I see a lot of a lot of people trying to walk through that area, like you know, somebody walking with their mom and things like that. Um, and when they do get to the, you know, the the maintenance area, well, right now, right, because the fence is there, it's a bit of a disappointment. For them they kind of try to figure out where to go and they can't kind of get up that that uh informal slope on quiet wood that there's kind of another exit there so i just was curious whether the commission was interested in i don't know if we have like a capital projects list or how we think about what we might do you know year to year but it's something that i'd be interested in is actually making that you know kind of an accessible entrance to the trail back there it would make a nice little loop um, for people who have, uh, you know, kind of limited mobility, another addition. I know we have that in the park. Sometimes the park can be pretty busy with kids' bicycles and things like that, and it just could be a nice addition to the community over there. So I just put that out there, maybe. For yeah, and about it I sometime. actually meant to bring this up um, because uh, I, I spaced it and forgot on it. I yeah. Just acknowledge and put on the record that. Uh, the commission did receive a correspondence from Linda Barnello regarding that, um, who has brought this topic up you know, on multiple occasions. Um, and the commission has discussed this on multiple occasions, including during tours of that very specific area. Um, and you know, the consensus has always been to leave that as it is. One thing Luke and I have talked about doing is putting up some more clear signage right there um, you know, that indicates it's a, uh, you know, something along the lines of a, uh, you know, slippery conditions proceed with caution so that people are aware in the interim. Um, and then, uh, you know, as we've kind of discussed in the past, as you're, you know, going into looking at larger modifications, that's, that becomes a pretty big project. And you then again get into, you know, potential levels of permitting and compliance and, uh, maintenance and things like that too so you know it's up to the commission if it's something that they would want to discuss again um, it has been discussed uh, and i guess this is probably a little bit right before you join the commission and uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it certainly is a topic that's been discussed multiple times and the yeah. you know the kind of consensus recommendation was always to leave that as is uh, you know recognizing that there are you know, three other entrance points on there that are much more accessible. Um, and then as I had, uh, you know, brought up the, when they redid all the sidewalks, uh, you know, with the things, uh, and I have an old communication I got to find as well, um, that talk about that specific area and reasons why the county didn't include that as a curb cut um, and a safety and actually removed the sidewalk from that point as well so I'll have to find that as well because it, it, it actually kind of bolstered the commission's general thoughts on why we haven't uh, why we've decided to kind of leave that area as it is uh, which is you know kind of a long standing and long multiple discussed but I, I you know I leave it up to the commission whether they want something like that on a future agenda my general sense is that this has been discussed kind of in great detail in the past already too. I don't know if John or John have anything else to add. You know, I'm happy to talk about it again. I think my opinion on that is consistent with where it's been. Um, if, you know, it's, I, I don't want to be in the situation where we're micromanaging um, Luke's time and Luke's staff time and juggling his priorities because I don't fully know the full breadth of priorities he has. I mean, we talk about a lot here, but I don't know everything. So um, with that said, if, if this is a big concern for the community, then I, then I think we should, um, we should address it. Um, that I've not been led to believe that it is a big concern from the community. So, I think the last time we looked at it, it was just kind of like we could keep it the way it is because we're, it's, it 
hasn't been, my perception is it's not a big concern. Um, and I know there was some conversation about making that an ADA pathway and, you know, just, uh, just for some clarification, ADA, ADA is for the built environment for pavement, concrete pathways, things like that. When you're on earth and trails, um, ADA doesn't apply. So we could make it more accessible, um, that connection from the pavement to the earth and trail, but it, it wouldn't be an ADA connection. Um, you know, Marin County Parks, we have something called inclusive access plan, which you know has its own set of guidelines uh, regarding grade and cross slope and firm and stable surface and whatnot. Um, so that applies more to earthen pathways. And, and that's something we could certainly do if we think it um, is a priority. I think my other concern would be that if it was to be ADA compliant on the pathway, then it would also have to be changed out at the street because you can't lead from an ADA point to a non-ADA point. Uh, so that would require then also a curb cut on the street and the truncated domes and the, you know, the whole shot. So it, it would be quite an involved project because you'd have to be doing the construction in the park and then also construction on the street. So if we could meet John's perspective of path compliance, then we don't have to meet ADA compliance at, the, at Quietwood as well. It might be something cool if there's a way to do it where it makes it more accessible, but we're not, you know, bound to have to follow, you know, strict ADA with a full ramp and regrading and everything. But some way to put in some stairs or just something like that. I just think it would be a value add. I, so for context, like I live like right by there. So I take my dog out every day and throw the ball for him on the path behind Quietwood. So I just see how many people approach that slope and it would just might be kind of a lovely value add in the community to have that that particular point be something that is a little bit easier to access it's less i think about like a a concern and more like i mean that was initially what got me thinking about it was the the concern letter but then i just opened my mind up and was like you know this would be really lovely it could be really nice to have a little bit better access right there it just creates um you know opens it for more people to be able to to, to use that path you know I, i'm thought. certainly happy to talk about it uh, some more and especially with your perspective um so i, I think that would be great and we did talk about things that we could do um i remember the last time we looked at it we talked about you know because it's it's steep from the pavement or concrete or whatever it is to the down to the you know the maintenance path it's a steep grade change and so we could build a earthen ramp um you know and we could even potentially do it with volunteers um so like things like that could be done um but again i i've not been led to believe that it's um that it's concerning for a lot of people if if that's not true then I'm all for increasing accessibility if, if it's a limitation for people. Uh, here's what I would suggest. Again, and I'm happy to you know follow up. I, I think that we're getting into a little bit too detailed of a conversation on this specific topic for an item that hasn't been agendized. So if this is something that we want to agendize for a future meeting, then that is the path that we should go. Um, no pun intended here with talking about a path, but uh, Otherwise, you know, getting into too much of a conversation on this, I think you're starting to, uh, uh, you know, flirt with some compliance issues. So it's either something we talk about in detail at a later meeting or not. And then I'm also happy to meet with you offline about this uh, as well. Um, Cause I do have, you know, also concerns um, that are counter to the points that were made in terms of liability that when you start making improvements, you actually take on more liability than uh, leaving it in its natural state. So uh, all things to talk I, about. I don't know about that, Eric. I, I'm not sure. I mean, we could talk about that more, but I, I don't know if I would agree with that statement. Yeah, well, when some of the things that we've talked about, you know, putting in steps or things along 
Yeah. You know, so. so steps are handrails, but if it's an earthen ramp, right. you know. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, you and I are on the same page. These are my points. So uh, at any rate, um, again, if it's something we want to put on a future agenda to be discussed properly, then that's how we should do it. Otherwise, we get much too far into the weeds and the penalty side. Funny too. Ultimately, was a correspondence. But it, it seems like there's enough interest to speak about it or agendize it for a meeting we could do it in our january meeting we could welcome yeah. uh, ian would i'm sure would have some perspective on that as well yeah so yeah and you'll have another uh, commissioner at that point too and then if it's agendized it gives public opportunity to come in and speak to it as well if they so choose so we can let's move in that direction then okay uh any other future agenda I guess we're good. And we'll uh, move to item number seven, which is the adjournment. You know, it, it looks like you have a public comment here, John, on the future agenda things. Can you hold one second? Probably can comment on our agenda items. Uh, yeah, they can make a comment about future agenda items. It, uh, there's no... Uh, Inclination that those items will be brought onto the agenda, but they're allowed to make a comment about it, sure, or a suggestion. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, you know that I I'm so happy that Anne has uh, brought up the point of the ramp. We've actually been talking about this for years. And I live on Quiet Wood Drive. I walk that area every single day. And um, I see seniors in particular, people with mobility issues. They like walking in that area because it's flat, because it's accessible, because it's nice and it's close to the neighborhoods. And um, John Campo had the solution that we've all thought that would work and it would be very simple it wouldn't require a, a lot of money um, which is an earthen ramp um, you know with a handrail this is what you see in in parks all the time it is very very frustrating uh, to receive the report that oh there hasn't been any a conversation about it there's been a lot of conversation about it but apparently because it comes from me and it comes from Linda Barnello who are the only members of the public to participate in um, our local community outside you you board members uh, you know it, it just gets brushed aside but we ha we have literally hundreds of people walking in that area every day and the only Anne is correct. The only thing that that area lacks is an ease um, uh, and accessible. And I, I guess we have to be careful about our language, but we want some, you know, someone with limited mobility to be able to walk up a ramp to get up to that road. It doesn't require, a, a, there's no reason to catastrophize here. There, I don't think there's a reason to put a curb cut and make this uh, a big engineering project. Basically, it's just a fortified ramp, a, a retaining wall uh, uh, on an angle. And you're right. I mean, if, if push comes to shove, it could be a, a volunteer effort. I don't, I, I'm sure you could do it almost, you know, you, you've got the little cats. It really, there's not a lot of equipment, a lot, not a lot of lumber involved here. You know, just do it really and and it would be a wonderful addition so i i'm all f for that and i i appreciate that ann has brought that up and the suggestions by john campo to make it simple and organic and let's stay away from the ada language because that's that that uh, becomes a political or that becomes a liability issue but we can we can certainly make it a better better way to access our park so I encourage you to, to discuss it and vote on it and do it. Thank you. All right.
right. We have it on our agenda for our next meeting, Stephen, so you can bring your comments back then. Anything else from the commissioners? Then I seek a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. A, a second. second? A second. All in favor? Okay. Good night. Okay. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And, uh, yeah. To confirm, all right, we'll meet again in uh, January, as we typically don't meet in December. Uh, the, I think it's like two or three days before Christmas. Okay. Uh, and just gets to be a busy time. So everybody have a wonderful holidays. Why well, don't hear from you or talk to you. And uh, as always, thank you for everything. Okay. Happy right. holidays. Bye. See you guys. Thank Peace you. Out. Cool.